Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to be doing another Dog Trainer Reacts, which is where I, a certified dog trainer and pet nutritionist, react to different pet related videos on YouTube so that I can share some educational information with you um, and overall just try to learn something. So today we're not even going to be reacting to a dog video, this is actually a cat video. And today we're going to be reacting to the Try Guys Eugene babysits Keith's cat for a day. While I do advertise that I am a dog trainer, I do have quite a lot of educational experience with cats just from working with cats uh, in a nutritional health and wellness situation for the last three years or so. So we're going to go ahead and watch this video and see what you think. Today, I will be babysitting a cat for the very first time. Not just any cat. I'll be babysitting Keith and Becky's cat, Alfred. I'm assuming that this is gonna be easier than a baby, but maybe more hard than a dog. My personal experience, cats easier than dogs. Cats are pretty independent. Dogs can be a little bit clingy. Not that you can see through this camera setup right now. I have both dogs sitting directly next to me. They're not gonna move for the next couple hours. So Eugene is going to come over and watch the boy do all the chores that you do if you are a cat owner, such as changing the litter, feeding the boy, playing with the boy, petting the boy, cuddling with the boy, snuggling with the boy, hugging the boy, petting the boy, kissing the boy, uh, and loving the boy generally. So that's a pretty good lineup of what needs to go into a cat's daily routine. Cats, like I said, fairly independent for the most part relatively low maintenance in that primary goals, feeding them, changing their litter, cleaning out their litter box, etc. You do want to make sure that you play with your cat every day, even if they don't seem like they're into that. You definitely want to give them that enrichment opportunity. And then just enjoying the company of your cat. And that's pretty much the highlights of cat ownership. Oh my gosh, look at you, so fancy. I always have to babysit in a suit. Hello, this is Hatchburger. Uh, I'm here to interview for the position of number one Alfred Stan. Yes, number one Alfred Stan. What um, experience do you have with cats? One New Year's Eve party, I was the only single person. So when they did the countdown, I didn't know to kiss and the owner had a cat. So I turned and uh, tried to kiss the cat and it scratched me across the face. I was bleeding and single that one New Year's in my 20s. Wow. And that's how I would sum up cats. Uh, the only real scars that I have on my body are from cat scratches for my cat that's not even mine. I was literally holding it for like three seconds. It got spooked. It's a thing. What you do want to be aware of with cat scratches and cat bites is cats harbor a whole lot of bacteria. So if you ever do get bitten or scratched by a cat, make sure to clean that super, super well, lots of disinfectant, and monitor it for sure. If you've been bitten by a cat, and especially if it's broken skin, I recommend going to the doctor like as soon as possible. Just because, like I said, tons of bacteria and cat scratches and cat bites are known to get super infected and cause a lot of issues. I feel like when you meet a dog, it's almost like running into an old friend at a bar. Every time I meet a cat, I feel like I'm going into an interview for a job. It's very nerve wracking if they're gonna like me, if they're gonna prove. So the one thing that I definitely want to highlight here, you never want to corner an animal or force them to do something that they don't want to do. This particular situation I think was handled fairly well considering what was needed to get this particular shot for this particular video. If you put your cat somewhere and they want to leave, you allow them to leave. If you go to grab the cat and try to force them there, that's when claws will fly and incidents can happen and it can be very harmful to both yourself and the cat. So picking him up, putting him on the bed, allowing him to leave is ultimately the best way of handling that situation. As far as the multiple attempts, 
Um, they do try quite a few times and I'd say if after maybe even the second time it's not working, move on. You can always go and try to build a connection with that cat and make them trust you a little bit more, but continuing to put them in that situation just for them to leave, you're gonna get frustrated, they're gonna get frustrated, and when those tensions start to rise, again, bad things can happen. So that goes with any animal. If you have a dog that comes over and they're weary of your friend and they want to leave the room when your friend comes in, don't keep forcing them into that situation because nothing good comes out of it for anybody. This is a wet treat. It is his favorite thing in the world. All you have to do is shake it and hear it and come running. This is the secret to getting our cat to love you. So a couple things to unpack here. We're gonna go ahead and start with the biology of a cat and kind of work from there. So cats are obligate carnivores. That means that the amino acids, the proteins, all of the vital nutrients that they need to survive, they don't produce themselves. They need to get those from their kill, from their food, and that needs to be meat. So amino acids, the proteins, the nutrients that they need comes directly from meat and that's what they need to continue living. Cats are also not natural water seekers, which means that in the wild, all of their moisture and water intake would come from, again, their kill. And in this case, with domestic cats, it's typically wet or raw food that they would get that from. They don't naturally seek out water. You'll probably notice that your cat doesn't really drink very much water. And if you think your cat does, your cat should be drinking about eight ounces of water. So measure out eight ounces, put it in a bowl, leave the bowl out, and then put it back in the measuring cup and measure it the next day. If your cat's really drinking eight ounces of water, I commend you, that's awesome. You should probably still be feeding a wet or raw food anyway, but that is how much water your cat should be getting. If your cat doesn't get enough moisture, it can cause to a lot of bladder, urinary, and kidney issues. In fact, one in three cats will develop kidney disease, which sucks and it's super preventable in most cases. Just literally add more moisture to your cat's diet. As much moisture, as much wet food, as much meat, as much raw food as you possibly can afford. How does this all tie into what we just watched? When people refer to wet food as a treat, like Keith just did, it definitely puts a very particular thought process in your mind. When you think treat, you think, Optional. You think every once in a while. You think something super special that's not typically in their diet. For example, when I think of chocolate cake, I think of a treat. I don't think of it as an essential part of my diet. For the most part. It's cake. What you really should be doing, especially around wet food, is thinking of it as an essential required part of the diet. So if you were to make a cat food pyramid, what food is on there. He also refers to it as lunch, which makes me think that maybe he's incorporating it at least once a day, which is awesome. If you're able to incorporate wet food once a day, that's way better than nothing. He's also using Fancy Feast, and this is where the very particular, like, nutritional aspect of my brain hits hard and comes to play. Because Fancy Feast is not a great brand. I'm just gonna flat out say Fancy Feast very affordable and that's you can tell that it's very affordable when you look at the ingredient panel in fact let's not to totally throw shade here but let's look up an ingredient panel okay so i don't know if this is the exact flavor i definitely tried my best and i'll definitely flash it up on the screen as well but i've just pulled up purina's own website i have the fancy feast broth um, which looks like what keith was using in this video and we're just gonna take a look at the ingredient panel. And I also just wanna put this out here. I'm not doing this to try to throw shade. I'm not doing this to be mean and critical, but there definitely is a lot that pet owners don't know about the food that they're feeding to their pets. And we just kind of take commercials and take what's on the store shelves and take that as what we should be feeding. And instead of kind of looking into things, asking, a professional who has a little bit more nutritional knowledge. Um, so really, this isn't to be mean. This is purely just to help educate you guys uh, a little bit on some food here. So I have found the ingredient panel, and ultimately, 
they do advertise that this particular one doesn't have any byproducts, which is awesome. You definitely want to look for a food that does not use byproducts. However, um, this one does use tapioca starch, which isn't great. They also use potato starch. Again, not great. Um, more concerning to me, though, is they have wheat starch, sugar, soy protein, and coloring, which is... Why are you adding coloring? Why are those ingredients so concerning? Corn, wheat, soy, um, definitely three things that you want to avoid. Corn turns directly into sugar. Wheat is the highest known allergen, most common food allergen, and soy can cause a lot of endocrine disorders. So think of hypothyroidism, Cushing's disease, that kind of stuff. And then the fact that sugar is added directly in here, they're essentially wanting the cat to get addicted to it, which is what a lot of lower quality foods do, is they add usually corn um, instead of sugar. But in this context, think of corn as sugar, because that's how the body processes it. So you're feeding this to your cat, and they do get addicted to it. Cats are already known for being super picky. And so this just perpetuates, oh, this is the only thing my cat eats, this is the only thing my cat eats, this is the only thing my cat eats. And it's because they are quite literally the definition addicted to this food. So there's definitely better brands out there. Um, not that any of the Try Guys would ever see this, but if you yourself are feeding Fancy Feast, I definitely recommend doing a little bit of research, reaching out to me if you'd like, I always have my uh, professional email down in the comment section or in the description and I'd love to help get your cat onto something a little bit healthier, a little bit better sourcing, better ingredient quality, etc. <laughs> Oh, he knows. Oh my god, he's so smart. Okay, Alfred. So normally the dog is not consistent. He just listens. He just screams until he gets it. Hey, Alfred. Now remember, I'm your friend. Oh, good boy. So remember when we talked about how you don't force your pet into a situation that they're uncomfortable in because tensions rise, issues arise, and that can be very, very bad for everybody involved. So this is a great way of getting your pet used to a new person or a new situation, and that's creating positive associations. So in this case, cat's maybe not so sure of Eugene. Eugene's the one giving really high value reward. And so in turn, that's causing the cat to trust him a little bit more. So this can happen with anything really. If say you're walking your dog down the street, and at a particular time of the day, there's always a garbage truck and your dog hates the garbage truck, fears the garbage truck. If you just sit there and give treat after treat while the garbage truck goes by, it'll slowly start to lessen their reaction to the garbage truck. So they associate garbage truck with, oh my gosh, I'm about to get like seven treats all at once. So have encouraging friends, family, whoever, to reward your cat with their favorite treat is perfect that's the way you should do it if your cat doesn't want to take directly from their hand or directly near them have them walk up put the treat down walk away let the cat come back cat can retreat have them walk back up put a treat down walk away and just do that from a distance and eventually slowly start to limit the distance until they're able or comfortable enough to approach them. Um, tell us his whole life story. Our sweet little baby boy. So in April, Keith and I were looking to adopt a cat. Mm -hmm. The people that were, the people that rescued him said that he was the biggest cat they had ever seen. So we went to see him. He immediately like jumped in Keith's arms, was licking him, was like Keith pet him everywhere. And the shelter told us that he was actually rescued from Mexico. He was in a hoarding situation where he lived with 70 other cats. Now, unfortunately, hoarding situations, particularly with, Lee, with cats, is fairly common. Um, it, that doesn't mean it's a good thing. It means that it's something that we as a society need to address. A big reason why this is such a big thing is cats do breed fairly frequently. They tend to have larger litters. Um, and a lot of the time we get colonies of cats. So even if you're not 
hoarding them in your home. Maybe you have a neighborhood cat colony with hundreds of cats just kind of roaming. Best thing you can do in that particular situation is get involved with a CNR program, so catch, neuter, release. A lot of shelters are involved in this, and it's typically you catch the cats, you take them in to get neutered, and then since they're feral, you re-release them to the colony. This doesn't immediately make your numbers smaller, um, but by spaying and neutering the adults, you will maybe have 10 males, and then the next year you'll have 8 males, and the next year you'll have 6 males, and eventually you just dwindle that population naturally without having to do anything too weird or extreme. This is the best way to handle a colony, and especially if you can get the kittens and get them used to human touch, you're then able to adopt them out to a family. He's Mexican-American. He is Mexican. He is, yeah, he's a first-generation immigrant. Do you ever speak Spanish? Are you trying to teach him Spanish? So we did when we first got him. We... Wait, I thought that was another No, it's true, man. So we had Maggie call him on speakerphone and talk to him in Spanish. And then we just made a guess at what his favorite music would be, so we put on Selena, because we love Selena. So we put on Tejano <laughs> music for Alfred? Yeah. That is so <laughs> my way. So it is fairly common, especially when you live on the West Coast, like I do and like the Try Guys do, um, to get pets coming up from Mexico. So people will go down, they'll rescue a bunch of animals and bring them up here to be adopted out. Big reason is because we, in the States, tend to have a little bit more laws and enforcement and practice around deterring street dogs and instead bringing them into shelters and hopefully adopting them out. There are definitely high kill shelters all over the place that handle this differently. Um, but in my experience, the shelter local to me that I volunteered at often um, would have a whole bus go down and they would take High kill shelter dogs bring them up here, where we don't have very, we don't have any strays. We're pretty well handled as far as dog wild dog populations, that kind of thing. And there's a high demand for adoptees, so that's kind of how that works. Is they'll go down to Mexico, get a bunch of dogs, bring them up here, where people are constantly searching for more dogs, um, and adopt them out. So often I'll be working with these dogs that have been rescued from Mexico, brought up, and adopted out, where we will lure, lure or shape the behavior and the dog will get it right away, but then if we verbally put a cue to it, it there's a little bit of a disconnect, so you know that they know what you're wanting them to do, they just don't know the words that we're using. And that's pretty common, and it's usually, if we give a Spanish command, the dog knows what's happening, they, they're good. They know what's up. And so speaking, even with people, just like with people, speaking in a familiar language will help bridge that gap, although it's not necessary. Don't think that if you're adopting an animal from Mexico, for example, that you need to be fluent in Spanish. You just need to be aware of that. It's a little cool thing, a little quirk that goes along with their history. Y'all have a very clever <laughs> setup where their box is disguised as a house plant. Very convincingly. Very convincing. <laughs> so it's actually a really cute litter box. Basically, with litter boxes, you should, if you have one cat, have two litter boxes. If you have three cats, you should have one for every cat plus one. And that's just so no one gets territorial and that there's plenty available. Cats can be really weird about litter boxes. Um, so if you are just now introducing your cat to a litter box, say you want a hooded litter box like this one, you'll start without the hood, let them get used to going in and out, then you'll put the hood on and let them get used to going in and out that way. And then if you, God forbid, have a litter box with a lid, uh, you'll put that on last and have them get used to going in and out with the lid. So you put it in parts. Hooded litter boxes, when you have other pets, on the other hand, can be a little bit tricky just because, yes, they help keep, say, your dog from eating all the cat poop, but especially if you're in a situation where maybe not all of your cats get along, maybe your dog and your cat don't get along very well, that can make the litter box very scary because there's only one point of exit, one point of entry, and say you have two cats, they don't get along, and your one cat will actively search out and hunt your other cat. Going into that litter box, 
immediately corners them and it will deter them from wanting to use it. Oh, it really is like sifting for gold. Cletus, we're gonna be rich. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of poop. And the pee, so the pee is the pee. Oh. And then once a month, you dump the whole litter box, wash it down. And this is <gasps> So we'll pause that there. Um, yeah, cat allergies, cleaning a litter box might not be a great idea. But let's back up a little bit. So a couple things that I want to talk about here. Types of cat litter can obviously differ. Some cats have preferences, some people have preferences, some magic litter boxes have preferences. Ultimately, I don't recommend clay for any cat just because especially if they're young, they can eat it, ingest it, it can cause blockages. If they're old, it can get stuck between their feet and then cause a lot of issues, because that hurts. Like, cause a lot of issues. I'm not a fan of clay, period. There are a, little, a lot of different alternatives. Um, Corn-based litters work really, really well. Those are the ones that I typically recommend to people, uh, just because they tend to be septic safe even. You would definitely have to check the packaging. But a lot of those corn-based litters do tend to be septic safe, which means you can just toss it in the toilet, flush it, call it good. Um, but definitely there's other alternatives to clay litters. There's pine, there's paper, there's corn, there's probably a bunch of others that I don't even know about. You also want to clean your litter box every day, otherwise it gets real gross, real stinky. If it's too gross, your cat won't want to go in it, period, and then that's when they typically will go outside the box. Um, and then making sure that you actually empty everything out, hose everything down, soak it in soap, clean it really well at least once a month, like they said, um, just because ammonia does build up. Ammonia is that really gross smell that can cause a lot of issues. And then plastic in general absorbs things super well. So if you have a plastic litter box, I'd say toss it every three to six months. That of course isn't super eco-friendly. It's not very sustainable. Um, they do make like litter box bags that you can put in there and that'll help make things not absorb as well. Um, but just keep those informational pieces in mind. Oh, he's licking me. Ow, it's a weird tongue. <laughs> What's it, sounds Spike? Oh yeah, cats have barbed tongues. That's not the only thing on a cat that's barbed. Cats do have barbed tongues because they were, again, made to eat meat, made to kill things and eat them. Um, so cats have those barbed tongues to get the meat off the bone as they're licking their kill. It's like nature's fork or a spork. So Eugene's never actually cared for a cat before. We decided to throw some things in that are not true. So he has these little scratch pads in front of the window, but his vet was telling us, because he's old and he has like really bad nails, that sometimes they can like rot. And so you have to sniff the scratch And if it smells like eggs, you have to tell us. So obviously this is a joke. They've explained it to us. These are all things that aren't real. But let's see if we can get some uh, real information in here. So scratch pads, scratching posts, scratching, scratching is a super primal thing for cats. Not only does it help to keep their nails in check, um, but it's also a way that they spread their scent and mark their territory. So you definitely need scratching posts in your home if you have a cat. Some people, a lot of people, their cats will try to scratch their furniture and obviously that can be very frustrating. Best thing you can do in that situation is for every one no, you want two yeses within about three feet. So for example, if the couch is a no, don't scratch this, you would want two different yes, you can scratch on these things within a three foot radius. So that way you're not just taking, 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 you're also giving them good things that they can do instead. So another way of reinforcing that, double-sided tape on your couch. They don't like the feeling of that tape. Spray some catnip on your cat tree, make that more enticing. And then eventually they'll learn that 
Scratching on this is not fun. It's sticky and it sucks. Scratching on that, super fun. Smells good, I love it. They also talk about wanting to smell the scratching post because if it smells like eggs, it means that his nails are rotting. It's not a thing, but cats can have smelly feet. So dogs as well. If you have a pet and their feet smells like corn chips, uh, that is usually yeast. And so yeast can come from a bunch of different things. Most commonly, it's a food allergen. So if you do have a pet and their feet smells like corn chips or Fritos or whatever, definitely take note of that. Definitely take a look at the ingredients in your food. If you have any questions, again, I have my professional email in the description. Totally feel free to reach out. I'd love to help you with your nutritional needs for your pet. We read this thing online that said if you want an outside cat to trust you, that they have to get used to your scent. So you're actually, we have a towel out there that the cats like to sleep on. No, so no, you sit on the towel. Just sit on the towel, mm -hmm. kind of like rub my butt shake in your it. booty on it. Yeah. Okay. Most importantly and surprisingly, I have to mark my scent on this towel mm -hmm. so that they feel comfortable with me. Everything in there was true, aside from the actual rubbing your butt on the towel. The more that a feral cat gets used to your scent, the more they're gonna recognize that scent, associate it with food, and then trust you when you do approach them. So just like I said, when you're getting your personal cat used to somebody, having that scent exchange is gonna help them trust you in the future. You don't need to rub your butt on the towel unless you have particularly smelly scent glands on your butt. Uh, but just wiping your hands, maybe the sides of your neck, and then leave it down. You're good to go. That was close. That was close. I got like, I got like one affirmation. One affirmation. And then I laughed. So that was much better. So they put Alfred on the bed. They tried to get them to interact. He stayed for a little bit, and when he was overwhelmed, didn't want to be there anymore. He went off and did his own thing and that's perfect you don't want to try to make sessions too long you want to keep them short and sweet give the pet all of the control really um, but that was great progress especially for a day so if that's all you can get out of your friend's cat or if that's all your friend can get out of your cat be proud of yourself that's awesome So a couple things to unpack here. So throwing a toy for your cat, some cats are into it, some cats will fetch, some cats not into it whatsoever. So that's where teaser wands, that kind of thing comes in. I would not whip him so he has to, feels like he has to defend himself. Um, dangling it in front, making noise, dangling it in front of the paws, that kind of stuff. Trying to entice him with making it seem like prey. Because that's ultimately what cats are doing in that play situation. Is they are hunting, they are... They're hunting, they're finding prey and then they're killing it. So with cats, again, some cats much more energy than others, but play is very important. And the best way to go about it is to get them engaged, 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 give them a couple seconds to cool down. After they've cooled down, go again, go again, go again, and it'll take probably four, five, six sessions of super intense play, super intense play, couple seconds of rest, super intense play, couple seconds of rest. And then the best thing to do immediately after these really high intensity play sessions is that's when you should feed them. So they've caught the prey, they've killed the prey, they've caught the prey, they've killed the prey, they caught the prey, they killed the prey, and now they get to eat, and then natural progression of things, they eat, and then they rest. That is the best way to expel energy from your cat, to engage them, to get them to play. That's also a great way to try to get your overweight chubby cat to lose a couple pounds. So now I'm going to cook Alfred's favorite treat, which is a single shrimp. Never cooked a single shrimp. 
I've only done this once for Alfred. Typically, it's when I'm making press shrimp. I make him one as well, because he typically smells it. So that's awesome. You heard me mention that you should always be feeding your animals more meat, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you take time to make them their own freshly prepared meal, but if you're eating shrimp, cook a shrimp without seasoning for them. If you're eating chicken, cook some chicken without some seasoning for them. In fact, for the most part, all you really have to do, just cook it on either end to kill bacteria. And if you feed your pet some raw meat, that's totally fine. That's what they're meant to eat anyway. Little disclaimer, raw food that you would buy for your pet has to have 0% pathogens according to the FDA. Human meat you buy for yourself can have 4% pathogens according to the FDA. So that's why you wouldn't want to just take it out of the fridge and feed it to your pet. But you can lightly cook it and it can still be a little bit on the raw side and you're totally fine. In fact, it gives them a lot more nutrients and digestive enzymes. So always, whether you feed it raw or cooked, if you're able to give your pet more meat, always do it. So that is all for today's video. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed. If you have any questions about anything that was addressed in this video, anything that you'd like to add, please feel free to leave those in a comment down below. And if you have personal questions about pet, food, nutrition, totally feel free to email me at the email address in the description box. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for more. And definitely recommend anyone that you would like me to react to in the future down below. That is all. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll see you next time. Bye.